Greetings community, thank you for being patient with us as we work through a few technical difficulties, but we are glad to finally be here for Hangout of the Avatar. Today we're going to talk about crafting, and to start us off, Lord British. Hey everybody, again, uh, so also sorry for the delays and thanks. It, I'll, blame, I'll blame Scott, whichever side of me is on here on your screens. Uh, but uh, there were little technical delays down there in Austin, Texas. But uh, again, as always, want to start with a thank you, thank you, thank you to you, our uh, wondrous community uh, who's uh, been following us along and supporting us uh, and giving us great feedback. Um, this is obviously a work in progress, uh, as a usual caveat, and especially this one. The, uh, uh, the crafting stuff is just now coming online. If those of you watched the uh, RTX demo where we showed a little bit of a first taste as we got some of the first two crafting tables online, and uh, it's Scott Jones who did a lot of that work on the crafting tables, who's been doing a lot of, the, lot of the work, along with Jay, who's you can sort of see a little bit behind him. Uh, but let me introduce Scott Jones to say hi, and then uh, I'll, I'll kind of uh, take us a little bit into today's topic. Scott? And Gina, you need to unmute him, or he needs to know how to unmute himself. I think I did unmute him. Am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? You are. Yes, Go ahead, are. Scott. Now we can hear you. Yay, that's bizarre. I wonder how I got auto-muted. Uh, my name is Scott Jones. I'm one of the artists here at Portalarium. You may have seen me before when we were uh, talking a while back about user interface. So here we are into the next step of that, which is the real-world objects representing some of the user interface for the purposes of crafting. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. And um, uh, for those of you who watched the, uh, the RTX uh, demo that we put together, the first two tables that were dropped into the game uh, were the sawmill, as well as uh, the uh, uh, carpentry table. And with those, uh, what you might have seen, and Scott may be able to pull those two up if you happen to have them handy, but with what you saw with those two tables is, is our general theorem of crafting, which is that you're first going to go out into the field, uh, you're going to harvest raw materials. Uh, that could be, uh, in the case of, uh, of the arc we tried to show at RTX, that would be you would chop down some trees and find some, uh, get from those trees logs. Uh, in fact, um, uh, those logs that you bring back, uh, right now there's only one tree you can ch chop, chop down or one type of tree, but uh, uh, eventually you'll be able to chop down a variety of types of wood to use as a basis that you could then bring to your uh, saw table, which I see has Scott now has up on his screen. Uh, That's on, right. On that sawmill, you would be able to uh, uh, chop logs into boards and dowels and uh, other small parts that you might need for making furniture. And then you could go over to his, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and by the way, that step for us is processing the raw material. So for most crafting loops, or many of the crafting loops, you start with things that you can harvest out in the wild. Could be meat or leather from animals, could be herbs or berries for cooking or reagents could be uh, the, the timber, like for the, the logs that we're creating. Then uh, once you've processed the raw material into the usable parts of a finished product, you would then move over to a second phase of crafting, which is the assembly of the final product. And that's what Scott now has on uh, the little thumbnail you can probably see from his window, uh, which is uh, the ability to uh, the carpentry table, a classic carpentry table, uh, which you could then use to uh, put things together. Uh, Scott, if you want to tell anybody about the little details on those two tables, why don't you uh, uh, do that again, but I'll let you take control of both audio and visual so your screen becomes maximized, so you can take people to the saw table and the carpenter's table. Certainly, no problem, and uh, hopefully you all can see these now. Uh, the first thing that I'm showing you is the saw table that Richard was talking about, and you can see a lot of different little elements here. Uh, originally, we had the, these tables cluttered up with tools and things like that, but we realized, of course, that uh, eventually these tools would be something that would be part of the recipe, which would allow you to uh, create stuff with these tables. So the tools would be something you'd be pulling from your own backpack, placing on top of the tables. Uh, we're still working on how we want that inter the user interface to look for this, but you can see elements of it actually right here, because the uh, uh, this little uh, area right here, this little placard, which is empty, and then this little smaller placard up here will eventually be a place where the craft button and then the close button would be so that the little X would appear in the right hand corner to let you close the table. Uh, but the table itself would appear in the 3D world uh, like this. Uh, you can see little rollers on the side that allow you to, uh, you know, the, the crude medieval uh, means by which to roll the logs across the table. Uh, the little 
uh, uh, shield right here, which actually you can set to allow for the width of board and things of that kind, just little details. And then, of course, because we didn't want to really give away the idea that there's actually a mechanism uh, because, you know, we're dealing with medieval uh, stuff here. But at the same point in time, it did need to sort of feel automated enough to where it can all happen on one table, which is why you have this little closed-in unit down here that might, you know, accessibly contain that kind of uh, uh, mechanical gear works. Now, the next table, which is this one right here, is the table that Richard was talking about that would you'd then go to next. It's the wood crafting table or woodworking table. And this bench, you'll notice, looks a little bit different than the other one. Uh, the reason why is because of the fact that, that you know, since, you know, time immemorial when wood crafters have been creating tables for their, for their uh, uh, craft, they had certain elements to them that were often in common, like these little... Uh, uh, these little uh, 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 what's the right word for this, Richard? A vice. There's a, a vice. Yeah, those uh, little vices. Go ahead. Go ahead. There you go. The vices set at 90 degrees to each other, and the little peg holes also, uh, as well as that recessed tray in the back. So for for woodworkers, this is a, a well recognized uh, piece of equipment because it allows you to do things like clamp chair legs and chair backs when the pieces are at 90 degrees to each other. So it's a very specific table for doing joinery. On uh, uh, with wood crafting, so it's uh, uh, if, if for those people out there who do woodworking, uh, you'll probably be familiar with the second table. And so, of course, you know what you're seeing here right now is the the uh, the surface that you would be working on, and and you'd have the tools that would be placed out on that. So, essentially, you'd have like a a, a pitch pot of glue, and 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 uh, you'd have a hammer and 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 uh, an actual bag of nails, as opposed to just you know a few little nails scattered around. Uh, the pegs, of course, you see some are sticking in the holes and some are just laying on their side above and below. And there's a drawer there that's assumed that you know there might be tools inside. Uh, but in general, the very basic table as is is what you'd work with, and then you'd place all your elements on top, including the uh, wood, the rough wood that you've just recently cut in the lumber in the saw the saw area, and uh, uh, and uh, hammers and, and saws and other things like that that you might be doing small work with. And. and so, uh, and if I may jump in here, Scott, one of the nice things about this, too, uh, is that these tables allow us a great deal of flexibility. Recipes are, can now be very diverse. You know, you can cut down uh, oak or ash or, you know, whatever types of wood we decide to put in as the entrance end of a recipe uh, all the way through to all the different kinds of furniture we eventually let you build. Uh, we'll, ma we'll make a very large pantheon, so to speak, of... Uh, of uh, furniture or items that could be uh, crafted uh, there with that table. And that same theory holds on all the other kind of crafting that we do. For example, just today I was filling out uh, the cooking uh, resources through a final product, or getting started on it, by the way. It's going to take, you know, it'll be months before the, the, the full list is done. Um, but uh, but when you think of a cooking one, and I don't think a cooking one is one of the ones you've done. I think you're working on the butchery table, I believe, which is part of the process. Yes, the predecessor to cooking. Yeah, predecessor to cooking. But if you think about cooking, you know, you're going to have things that go, first of all, you'll need tools, uh, not for the butchery side that you're looking at now, but on the cooking side, you might need pots or skillets or a mezzaluna, or and I learned the new word ulu today, you know, cleavers, fillet knives, paring knives, peelers, cooking tongs, soup ladles, graters, mashers, spatulas, strainers, steamers, rolling pins, and zesters might all be part of the process that you would need to do to use the, the cooking station. Uh, but then the ingredients, one of the ingredients is meats. And so what you see here is the table that Scott is working on for the preparation of meats so that after you, uh, you know, uh, uh, catch a fish or hunt uh, some game, uh, you'll bring it down here, back here to this game table uh, to do the field prep. Uh, and uh, you know, you'll start with a carcass of some animal that you brought back from the field but in here is where you'll end up with, whether it's beef fillets, rabbit fillets, uh, you know, uh, uh, snake meat picked off the bone, uh, you know, with trout or salmon or whatever else it might be, uh, this is the station where you'll do that uh, resource processing. So again, you would gather the resources in the field, fish or game, uh, you would process it into the steaks or fillets that you might need to cook it at this table. Uh, and uh, separately, by the way, there's a whole other path for collecting your culinary herbs. You know, I was just putting an herbs list together today of uh, things like mint, thyme, rosemary, dill, coriander, lavender, basil, and parsley, and you can probably get anything else in there you'd like. Uh, vegetables, of course, fruits, of course, grains that you'll be able to harvest, and then all those things will then be taken over as the raw ingredients into the cooking station, so we should be able to have a marvelously diverse set of, of uh, creations just with the uh, 
uh, the standard pattern of give you as many possible things to hunt or gather in the field, reprocess the raw materials whenever appropriate at one of these type of stations, then move it over to your finishing station, uh, be it cooking for food or uh, you know a, a similar uh, arc for uh, and if and, and Scott, I know you're reticent to show some of our crazy little sketches, but even if you held them up in front of your camera, uh, <laughs> you know, of, of things like um, another one we've been uh, that's next in his queue are things like um, you know uh, if you ki if you kill a uh, or you, uh, you you harvest a sheep, you would get the wool. The wool you can then spin into yarn on a spinning wheel. That yarn you can take to a loom and weave it, and uh, then you would take that cloth to. Uh, uh, to a sewing station. Uh, what do we call that station? The uh, uh, sewing table, I guess it was. I'm now looking through my... Uh, yeah, that, that's the tailoring. I think that's the tailoring. The tailoring? Yeah, tailoring. that's the tailoring, tailoring table. table. To, uh, to do that finished work. So, uh, um, uh, in any case, I think we have some very nice technology, very nice arcs, a standard methodology by which these things can flow uh, that will give us very diverse recipes to finish goods. Uh, but there we go. Yes, exactly. So, uh, 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 that, oh, that's the uh, the butchery that's, table, the one you're just that's showing. That's the butchery table, which oddly enough is showing backwards. That's really weird. Oh, that shows backwards to you, but forwards to us. It shows you a mirror of yourself. That's a Google Hangout feature. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, we see it the right way around, but you see a mirror of yourself. Yeah. So, so that's that's the really cheesy little quick thumbnail sketch that uh, helped decide yeah. how the butchery table would be made. Excellent. Uh, below well, it, you can see. Oh yeah, so there's the beginning of the spinning wheel, and in fact, the thing I like about, uh, I see Gina, can you force it to show his camera predominantly if you haven't already? Yep, I have it locked on his image right now. Perfect. And uh, uh, the thing uh, that I like about Scott's uh, is uh, uh, that uh, uh, we, we like, took a classic spinning wheel, but we tried to make sure we created a surface in front of it in order to be able to put down all the ingredients you need. You know, three spools of yellow thread and two bolts of yellow cloth if you're going to make some yellow armor, for example. And um, uh, things of that nature. Do you have one like with that? You have your, a sketch of your dyeing vats? And, uh, oh. the, Let me see. I think you had it with your tanning. Oh, tanning vat. You're tanning and dyeing and uh, leather making, I think, was, was one year. As, as someone, oh, yes. Go ahead. As someone who does uh, work with yarns and, and fabrics, that's really exciting to see the different types of tables that go into a, a lot of times crafting stations are simplified down to you know this is a generic tailor station or this is a generic cook station but these are very uh, specialized yep exactly so well there'll be uh, thank you Scott I think there'll be a, um, a total of uh, you know a dozen or two uh, by the time we're, we're all wrapped up uh, but Gina why don't we switch over to uh, some of the questions if uh, people have some queued up Sure. First question comes from Fire Angel. Um, she posted in the LB Soda underscore Hangout. And remember, you can always submit your questions early via the Hangout, and that way I have them archived. Um, she would like to know what is being done to keep crafting from being so simplistic that it's boring, uh, but also not so complicated that it's annoying. We don't want it to be rocket science, but we don't want to be bored to tears either. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that. Uh you know, as proud as a lot of us are uh, on this team who are also part of the Ultima Online experience, you know, uh, in developing it, um, we both feel passionate about, uh, about the uh, complexity of the crafting loops that we put in uh, to uh, those environments, uh, yet we also force people into a lot of repetitive, boring, mind-numbing, uh, you know, activities in order to, uh, to, uh, to level up. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, things we're trying to accomplish in this case is to, uh, to, to, to grab the benefit of that diversity but not force people into this mind-numbing repetition. And, and so that's one of the things we're trying to do with making sure that all of our crafting tables have a standard type of functionality. You just lay out the tools and ingredients on the table and say go. And if that is a, if that is a valid recipe that you have the valid skills to perform and all the valid equipment is on the table, it will consume the ingredients, it will leave the tools uh, behind, of course, uh, and then it will replace the ingredients with the finished products, and we haven't decided if there's a delay or lag time or what kind of animation, if any, could happen on the table. Uh, but we'll you know, make it as nice as we can, obviously. But uh, then you'll have the resulting object. So fundamentally, that's pretty easy to get your head around. And, uh, and now what we're trying to do is make sure that 
even if we're talking about foodstuffs, there's enough diversity both in ingredients and recipes to make it just fun and interesting to explore that system on its own. Um, and when you're talking about creating weapons and armor uh, are things that are useful to players, we're going to try to make sure that the base set of things that the game spawns to be usable as a tool like a sword or a resource, um, like a gem to, to put into a sword, uh, those are all at, you know, at, at a, a fairly common uh, level of uh, uh, value. And it is the crafters in the world who will then take those things and, and create a large diversity of very unique and more interesting, more powerful, more diverse tools and gear and weapons for, for players to use. So we're, we're, we're working very hard to drive uh, even all, all of the adventurers into having a close relationship with whoever their armorer is, for example. And we're trying to make it actually cool and interesting and important to go back into town and debate whether I really do want to get that big juicy steak, or if I'm, uh, you know, off to, uh, you know, get a, a chicken, pot, you know, a chicken pot pie or something, or an apple turnover somewhere, based on somebody's recipe that they've either discovered or created or uh, uh, you know, otherwise unearthed out of the game. Another place uh, you can submit questions is actually on our main site. Uh, we always post the Hangout a day ahead of time, sometimes a few days ahead, if I know, and we'll take questions there. This question, or actually two questions, comes from Twofold Silence. Uh, Twofold Silence would like to know what types of natural crafting materials will there be, and will we be able to take finished items apart after crafting them and return them to raw materials? Uh, yeah, great question. And by the way, let me also just point out uh, if Scott's screen, if you want to pull that one up too, is the uh, alchemy table, uh, both a pictographic uh, source. Oh, it was up there on your screen, Scott. Well, I'll make it happen. Hold on. Yeah, because it was kind of cool if uh, Jeannie wants to put that back up. Uh, it, uh, it was showing both a real photographic source uh, of an alchemy table from an actual historical example uh, over to, you know, the kind of the dissected uh, sketch that we're, we're working on now. And, uh, and I think uh, Jay, that's behind Scott right now, is, is building, assembling this exact one, if, I, if memory serves. Um, yes. In fact, and, uh, I can show you that. And, uh, but to, uh, oh, yeah, great. There it is in progress. So, yeah, right. Uh, fantastic. Scott, I'm glad you got that. Um, but, uh, but from a where will the resources come from, yes, we're, gonna tr we're trying to make sure that everything in the world is potentially a resource. You know, we, it's, it's a lot of fun to... Uh, even today, as I was putting together just the resources for cooking, uh, on the one hand, I was lamenting how big a list I'm going to make for the artist to have to draw. So I was actually trying to make sure I didn't, you know, blow the budget from uh, from an art standpoint. Yet on the other hand, I was also considering how fun is it going to be to literally go forage for mint and uh, you know rice and uh, you know all these other items that you might need to put a little mojito together or something to uh, to, uh, to to share with your friends. And uh, not that there's rice in the mojito. I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> but um, I'm getting my sake drinks mixed up with my vodka drinks, so uh, uh, or my rum drinks. The uh, but uh, but yes, the natural world will be rich in resources, both from just foraging in the woods up through parts and pieces you get out of uh, of uh, you know hunting or defeating beasts in the field. Uh, will also all be uh, raw materials you take into crafting. What was the second part of that question, Gina? Um, if items would be able to be taken apart and turned back into raw materials. Uh, yes, and so our intention is the, the short answer to that question is yes, but we haven't yet decided on um, you know how lossy it will be um, as to uh, uh, you know how uh, how it will break down. But uh, but in general, yes, you should be able to recycle uh, equipment in some way uh, because we what we don't want to do is have you end up with dead inventory that you've either acquired or uh, created that now you you really have to just go dump. And so we'd rather you get value out of that by disassemblage. Uh, but we haven't done the disassembly part of, the, part of it yet, but uh, the intention is yes. Tying with the diversity of ingredients and such, uh, Fredicon posted a question in the third place you can participate, which is live in our chat room. Um, roughly how many craftable items do you envision at launch for each profession? Uh, well, let's see. At launch... Uh, you know, it'll still be a fairly high number per, and it's, it's when I say per professional, let me say per finished goods table. So in other words, for um, for the sewing table, there would be at least dozens and potentially a couple hundred, I would imagine. 
Uh, and for food stuffs, at least again dozens, and you know, if we're lucky, get into the hundreds. Uh, for alchemy, again, at least dozens. Uh, so I think it, I think dozens is probably true across the board uh, as a as a minimum. Uh, but we'll be trending into the hundreds fairly quickly, I would imagine. As as it turns out, once we've set these standards and get the tables built, adding recipes is actually one of the easiest things we have to do because of how data driven it is. And um, uh, so I'm, I'm anticipating that, that recipes will come online fairly quickly. Uh, and in fact, uh, once the systems are up and working, um, you know, we don't have a path right now for players to put recipes directly in themselves into the game. And in fact, it might kind of blow the balance uh, if we did allow that. Uh, but uh, but we definitely would be open to suggestions. Uh, you know, one of the groups, the, one of the people I'm I'm really looking forward to talking with as soon as we have uh, some of this cooking stuff in. For example, the Hearth of Britannia folks. Uh, just because I know he's been assembling this recipe of all of our games of the past, and uh, it'd be great to make sure we include not only all of those, but uh, things that uh, any of you can imagine uh, could be built out of uh, you know the standard ingredients that uh, either have existed exist in the real world, have existed in our previous fantasy worlds, or that you see us creating with this uh, uh, new game. You know, even the list I put, I put together starting today about uh, uh, cooking again includes ingredients that I've never had in any of our previous games, and so I think it's going to uh, it's going to be much richer than uh, than previous. And Scott, uh, you want to tell us anything else about what you're showing there? You want, why don't you take us through the uh, butchery table? What what are its parts and pieces? Oh, certainly. Well, here, let me go ahead and let me go. I was just building a uh, fish head as you all were talking. So I'm taking one of the fish heads that uh, was made by Jay, and uh, Jay luckily had uh, already started creating some uh, some really wonderful pieces for uh, for our uh, uh, marketplace, and that includes meat and fish and things of that kind. Uh, what hadn't been done yet, of course, was the slaughtered pig, which was something that we had both talked about when we were first uh, 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 kind of going through the things we wanted for the uh, for the butcher table. Uh, and of course, this is the level of detail that I really enjoy. So at some point in time, even though we can't lay tools on the table, I do want to go back and add a, a significant level of detail to uh, the other tables too. Uh, you know, things like wood chips and uh, you know, wood shavings from the saw blade and things like that. Uh, likewise, on on the cooking table, we're gonna have powdered, you know, powdered flour and you know maybe herbs laying out here and there that aren't actual uh, bunches of herbs. But what we see here is we see uh, a wonderful slaughtered pig, and that's taken from a uh, uh, taken from a, a real good uh, photo source that you found, Richard. Uh, that shows it in just that position. Uh, you can see the kind of a slop bucket. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, tasty and delicious. In fact, if you look really closely, you can see you can see like part of the jaw and teeth here from some other animal that's under that massive slop. I'm a little uh, scared about that smile, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I'm on camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have the thing that you requested specifically, and it was like the uh, uh, part of the table is a, a stone surface, a marble surface that's been carved and set at an angle so that when things are you know, cut apart on that, blood runs down and into that little hole and down into the bucket, which you see below. So you have a blood bucket full of uh, delicious blood, uh, which, uh, oddly enough, is used to make blood pudding, so that's the reason why they often kept it. Um, uh, then you see the fish that are hanging up of different varieties, as well as some of the stuff that you get when you're done uh, with at the table, the idea being that you you know you'd have some of these finished cut pieces of steak that you would you would end up seeing these things in the market. Uh, so the idea being that of course, well you know you don't need the market necessarily when you can do it yourself if you have those crafting skills. Uh, the other few other things I'll be adding to this soon is just a, just some few more details. I'm going to add some stains to the surface uh, uh, and. Uh, 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 maybe a couple fish heads, one on the bucket and one on the table, and maybe a little bit of that left over on the table just to indicate that it's been used and, and is in use. Uh, uh, maybe something to tie the, the pig's feet up to the uh, the tripod there. And that's pretty much it. It, for the most part, is done. And from here, I'll be moving on to the uh, the cooking table. Uh, and, and the cooking table you actually saw uh, in some of those little pieces I was holding up. It had the big uh, round oven on the back. And, and that's the next step in this process. And uh, hey, even though I know it's Jay's work, since you have it in that file, can you scroll over to the alchemy table and just kind of describe its uh, physical function? Uh, yes, the alchemy table is pretty cool, and 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 you're right, Jay's done a fantastic job on that so far. Uh, what we're looking at here is a uh, we're looking at a series of uh, well, first of all, probably some kind of marble or stone table, and uh, on top of the table, it's been cut into a few areas where bowls. 
that are meant for heating are placed. And these little metal bowls will eventually have uh, uh, the kind of stuff that you saw in the uh, image earlier. Uh, you know, the, the wonderful the glass. Yeah, uh, let me see if I can pull that up real quick. Yeah, I've got it too, if need be. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. <coughs> yeah, see, so if you look at this, what you'll see is a uh, uh, an area that shows where the bellows allow for airflow down in inside that little hatch door uh, would, would be where you'd be putting the wood. And those little recesses are for beakers and, and decanters and things of that kind uh, where we'll have like something like that set up already just to kind of show you what's there, but there'll be enough space to allow for all your tools. And, of course, the, uh, the little stovepipe uh, up off the top. And, uh, uh, yeah, so it, it will appear as a functional table. And the cool thing about it is that it really is based very closely on a real uh, sort of a chemist. Yeah, and if you take a good look at this one, these pictures, now flip back again to your other screen there, Scott, if you would, and you can see how mm -hmm. uh, the model really is uh, doing, you know, uh, is not arbitrary, you know, it's not make-believe, so to speak. It really is, uh, you know, what an alchemist uh, has used in the past to uh, kind of keep things, little Petri dishes heated up and little uh, concoctions burbling away. Uh, as they try to, you know, transmute gold and um, lead into gold or something of that nature. That's right. And, of course, along with this would come a host of tools and, and, and rare items and, and, you know, minerals that you'd mine and other things that you'd bring to, bring to bear at, at a table like this. So it's going to be actually pretty cool to see those recipes come to life on, on these tables. And who knows, maybe eventually we'll, we'll get some uh, animating elements in these suckers. But for now, they're, 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 uh, they're stayed and in place, but they'll have a lot of elements that are at least visually exciting as you uh, watch your character go through the animations of, of crafting. Excellent. Okay, Gina, well, uh, let's see. We got started, uh, I see some people talking about the time. We, we, we got started about quarter after, was that correct, or was it a little yep. after? we got started about quarter after. Okay, well, we've got probably time for a couple more questions then. So, uh, Gina, do you have any more queued up for us? I do. Uh, the next question comes from Cool Phoenix. Will recipes be dropped, or can we buy them from a vendor, or can they be automatically learned or trial and error learned? Uh, and the short answer is all of the above is the, the broad intention. Uh, there will be both recipes that you can learn and pass down from one person to another. You'll be able to, uh, most recipes you should be able to copy, so to speak, uh, to somebody else's cookbook. Uh, you will have the metaphoric cookbook just so you can remember uh, what things put out on the table. But at, at the moment, our intention is that you don't actually have to have the cookbook. As long as you remember or know, or somebody has literally told you through the internet that the way you make a chicken pot pie is, you know, you dice some potatoes, you dice some chicken, you add in a handful of herbs and other vegetables, and put some dough in a pan, and you've got the pan, and you've got the brush some butter on the top, and you put all the right tools and ingredients out on the table, and your skill level is correct, and you say, put it all together, then it should work. And uh, that means, sort of by definition, you can discover recipes. But the fact that recipes are discoverable is also why we're trying to make sure that the amount of potential ingredients is big. Because that way, uh, the odds of stumbling into a valid uh, recipe without, by just random uh, association, uh, we're hoping is low enough to where you should feel some sense of obligation to either go learn it from someone else, or if you're actually a cook, we're going to try to fulfill that dream in the sense of if you're going like, oh, okay, well, if they're going to make it, you know, let's see if they made a chicken pot pie. If I was going to make a chicken pot pie, here's the ingredients I put together, and uh, and we're going to just have one recipe for a chicken pot pie. We'll have, you know, we'll let, we'll we'll likely think of uh, you know dozens that we might uh, include ourselves, uh, and uh, maybe take some submissions when people go, look, I have a great recipe for chicken pot pie, and mine, you know, uses twice the pepper that yours did, so you really ought to accept one that uses twice the pepper. Then you know we can add that too. And, uh, and I think that'll make it a, the, the whole recipe orientation uh, or you know, the, the alchemy orientation of creation, uh, I think will make it fun to both uh, contribute to for all of us, including yourselves, uh, and to discover uh, as well as a player. That kind of leads us to uh, the next question. Montague Payne would like to know, will there be multiple ways uh, people can collaborate or cooperate to make to make recipes or to make items using different crafting professions or different uh, ingredients. Yeah, so we've, we've tried to make sure that, uh, that each of the crafting uh, threads, uh, at a minimum, had uh, the first step of gather resources, 
a second step of refine those resources. So if it was uh, wheat, you might grind it into flour. If it was wool, you might spin it into yarn. It may or may not have an intermediate step after that, like uh, if it's yarn, you kind of weave it in a cloth before it goes to its final process, uh, you know, which is uh, taking that cloth and sewing it into a garment, which might also use a resource from a whole other path, which would be hunt another beast, tan its leather, and take that leather to the same final table to be able to take a, to create a garment that is out of both leather and cloth. And so uh, there's no question that it will take uh, multiple specialties. So you might need a trapper to catch you your pelts to get the leather. In fact, you might even just go to the tanner to get the leather. Uh, separately, you might know someone else who uh, you know has sheep in their backyard and uh, you can get some wool from them, and maybe they, since they already have wool, they might have a spinning wheel in their backyard, and they might sell you the yarn, or they might even sell you the cloth, and you might just be the person who, who does the final step. And so uh, uh, the, the game should, and, and the whole point of this is to have a great deal of interconnectivity between those different kinds of, of specialties. Similarly, you know, on the armor side, we have a whole part of the world that uh, we haven't talked to you guys really about much about, but there's a whole northeastern section of the of the world, or there's a particular area in the northeast, which is going to be particularly good hunting grounds for valuable uh, gems and, and gemstones. And uh, uh, so if you bring back gems or gemstones from that northeastern section I have in my mind, that would be good in theory both for the people making weapons and armor to make them jewelry jewel encrusted, but also could be used in people making clothing who want to you know, make uh, jewel encrusted you know, crowns or something. Uh, for uh, that might require some sewing them into your shirts versus uh, you know hand forging them into your swords. And we've had a couple people ask in uh, the chat channel, how will failures be handled, and will there be failures? I know uh, for moving here, I had to relearn how to make bread, and trust me, there were lots of failures uh, before I got that right at this temperature and altitude. So, will crafting have failures, and if so, how will that be handled? Yeah, so we, one of the kind of mantras that we chat a lot about uh, here is that uh, outright missing and outright failure is not commonly fun. Yet you also want to make sure that there is a challenge to doing it right. And so, uh, uh, so one of the things that we're currently shying away from is, you know, if you've been you know, if you took a basic dagger and made it into a better dagger, took a better dagger, made it into a fan great dagger, then into a fantastic dagger, and now it's an ultimate dagger, what we don't want to do is have you then lose the ultimate dagger down to nothing. Because we think to take something you've invested that much time and actual energy and actual resources in and destroy it because you failed on that, you know, take ten regular swords and make one great sword, and now it's all wasted and gone, we think that's too big a price to pay. Uh, but we don't think that every time you do something it has to work perfectly in the sense of, uh, you know, when I go to combine two daggers or the resources of equivalent of two daggers to make one better dagger, if that were to not work and therefore you still, uh, you know, you only lose some fraction of those ingredients or uh, you have to repeat the process or whatever it might be, we don't, we don't think there's a problem with, uh, you know, not being successful uh, and having to repeat or in the case of combat, having a glancing blow, especially that glass, glancing blow which did no damage, still might have interrupted their thought process or their defenses in some way. Uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, failure is fun in, this, in, a, uh, in the same potential way that, uh, uh, you know, the truth of the full success is fun. I think you're having fun tying up this pig here, aren't you? And <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's got to look right, man. It's got to look right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, well, why don't we take... Uh, we're at 4.47 now, so we're probably just about 30 minutes, but let's take one more question, if we can, Gina. Okay, last question comes from King Crispy, and he wants to know, are you planning on making crafting and vendoring economically self-sufficient to make it a standalone style of play for some people? Absolutely. In fact, very good point. Thank you for asking that, King Crispy. Uh, yes, we um, um, hope very sincerely, and I, I, that we'll, we'll balance it till that's till that statement is true. Uh, I think it's one of the things that I was so happy about uh, with Ultima Online, and one of the things that I know Star Long's efforts here on this team will help ensure 
is to make sure that there are lifestyles beyond adventuring, uh, which are complete and interconnected. They're interconnected with adventurers. They're interconnected with the other activities of a village uh, that uh, will make Shroud of the Avatar a living and breathing uh, world, a fully realized world, uh, with all of your help. So, uh, in any case, thank you so much. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Absolutely. And uh, thank you, our wonderful community. Um, as we get these recipes up online, uh, and, uh, and you get more of them out to you, and once we give you the basics of what ingredients are around, I look forward to hearing uh, uh, more uh, feedback from you, not only about the base system, but how we can enhance it uh, to better serve your desires and your needs. So. Uh, thank you and goodbye for me, and uh, I'll pass it over to Scott, and then Gina, you can get the last word. Oh, nope, I'm gone. Uh, no, you're still there, Scott. You can. Uh, you just have to unshare your screen. Okay, let me see if I can do that, though. Hold on. I don't know. The pig foot's kind of fun. Oh, oh now Scott is gone. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he was okay, really so gone. The final word, Gina. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start a thread on the forums, and hopefully we can either address some of your questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, um, or I can put those questions together for maybe another crafting hangout, because we certainly had a lot of questions this time, really good ones too, so I don't want to miss any of those answers for you. Uh, look for that later on today, and thanks again for joining us. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.